So it says that time, so let me start. So my name is Jocelyn Hurtado. I am the archivist at the Black Archives History Research Foundation. And this program is part of our Safer Our Home series, where we bring the Black Archives, we bring you different programs throughout the week, um, which are educational and entertaining. And we hope that you learn something about Miami's Black community. And my segment is called, Is It True? Tales from the Magic City. And this is where I dive into um, some of the myths, some of the stories, um, some of the little known facts from Miami in the near South Florida area and we see if there's any truth to it or what's the actual deal um, with these stories and myth and um, little bit, bits of information. So today's segment, give me a second, I'm going to flip over to my handy dandy notebook where I keep everything right down. It says, okay, give me one second. I have a lot of pages. Okay, is it true there is a house from the roaring from the roaring twenties that is still intact in Overtown, and this is an, another tale from the Magic City. So you guys might have been thinking like, hey, um, didn't we already discuss this um, a house that was built from in the roaring twenties um, that is still surviving in Overtown? Are you gonna go over the D. Dorsey house again? Um, you know, I know I talked about the D. Dorsey house and D. Dorsey house a lot, and I'm probably like. Um, you know, doing an overkill, but I'm not. Um, so you, can, you guys can relax. I probably can talk about the endorsing in his house until the end of time, but I'm actually going to talk about another house. And before I start, you know, in, I'm going to also want to give you a pre-context of what it was like in the 1920s. Because you see, in the 1920s, uh, Miami was actually in the middle of uh, actually started its first land boom. So if you recall from earlier sessions in the early late Miami was found in 1896 and um, in the early 1900s Miami was really um, starting to its development as um, from a small town to an actual big city. But by the 1920s, it was fully established as a city, a solid, stable city on the eastern coast of Florida, southern eastern coast of Florida. And it was in, in the middle of its first land boom. Um, there was a land boom that led to the creation of many um, neighborhoods that we know now as like um, neighborhoods in South Florida, such as Cora Gables, Hialeah, Miami Springs, Opalaka, and Miami Shores. So since it was in the middle of a land boom, there was a lot of economic activities. There was a lot of surplus. There was new buildings being built. There was a lot of employment. There was a lot of um, entertainment districts being built. There was a lot of hotels. So instead of having these small hotels to um, accommodate, um, you know, um, small population of, you know, the um, winter, um, winter crowd that came down south, now you had to expand because a lot of people were not only coming from those winter months, but they were also attracted to Miami because of the, um, the beaches, the um, different venues that it offers for entertainment, such as lounges, clubs, and also gambling. Gambling was a huge thing in South Florida as well as, like I said, the entertainment di district. In the 1920s, that's when you really see the beginning of prohibition. Prohibition was not really enforced in the early 1920s in Miami. And like a lot of people came here down south to kind of escape the strict rules up north. So Miami became like, you know, um, you know, what is later known as like, uh, Vice City. There was a lot of different places where people can come here and enjoy their time. And a little known fact was that Miami was actually a popular hunting ground. People came to Miami to hunt in the Everglades. They hunted things like deer, um, alligators, um, bears. Yes, there are bears in the Everglades. And they also hunted quails, um, ducks, and geese. So that was a popular activity as well. And in the 1920s, Miami population was, it had a stable population of around 40,000. And then in the winter month, that population grew um, because of the transient uh, visitors to 100,000. So you can see how this was a stable economy. And that stable economy affected every, all different types of neighborhood, whether it was white neighborhoods or color neighborhoods. So let me move on. So, and I also want to give you what a contact of, you know, what was, 
what was happening in the 1920s in America, it was a big decade for change. Um, by that time, um, Henry's Ford Model T was already in production for over 12 years. So Americans were driving cars. There you also see the increase of Americans who owned a radio and owned telephone lines. So now you see businesses, um, you know, having telephone um, numbers and things like that. And then you also see, um, you know, a big development of kind of like that middle class. But um, in the 1920s, you you really do see increase of business. Um, there was a lot of the men that fought in World War I returning back home. An interesting little known fact was, um, this is something that I picked up and I read in the Miami Metropolis. According to the Miami Metropolis, um, a big portion of Color Town populations, um, young men actually went to go fight in World War II. I mean, World War One. There were 65 colored men that were drafted. And according to this newspaper article, it said, um, Color Town, um, Color Town, Collier Town was almost depopulated when the draftees left. And this was published at the towards the end of World War One, which was in 1918. And you know, these men returned um, by the by the end of 19, um, by the end of 1920, beginning, I mean the end of 1919 and the beginning of 1920 when the Treaty of Versailles was signed. And also um, this Decade was really popular, you know, people like to think it as the Roaring Twenties, there you see the, not the emergence of jazz, but when jazz really started to spread beyond New Orleans and the Mississippi Delta, and you know, it reached places like South Florida, it also reached other places up north, and you also see that big entertainment district and entertainment as, as, as activity really start to boom. And the reason I'm giving you this um, information is because um, the house that I'm going to be talking about that was built in the 1920s, you know, it was, it's a sizable house and this basically shows, um, you know, a person who had the means to build a grand house, you know, and it was a common style of architecture style during that time. And you, I really want you to think that, you know, 1920s it, in Overtown, you know, not all of the roads were paved and there was not, um, not a lot of the houses had electricity, but there was a really big affluent community as well. And, you know, in the, you know, people think to like to think like the 1920s, you immediately think of the Great Gospies in that era. And I also want you to know that, you know, um, you know, big houses, um, big parties and things like that also happen in color town. So yes. So, you know, um, just to kind of drive it a little bit more, I also want you to think about this decade. There's a lot of things that happen, important things that happen in the color community in this decade. For example, the Miami Times was founded in 1923. You had the middle class community of the railroad shop that was already, um, you know, really well established. It was um, founded in 1915, but by the mid-1920s, it was, um, you know, it was established, no neighborhood. And you also had different companies that played a huge impactful role within the community. For example, you had the J&S building that was constructed, um, which was um, housed the Colonnet Bottling Company. And then you also had emergence of different kinds of, um, you know, influential um, members of the black community. You had Dave Dorsey, you had a lot of the physicians, you have a lot of the educators, you had some early politicians. So, you know, it was a big decade. And this also, this decade also, you see the construction of Miami's first um, black high school, which was Booker T. Washington House. And, you know, you did have an affluent community with a lot of physicians. And then speaking of physicians, um, so my story, like this segment is, is it true? Um, there was a house built in the Roaring Twenties that still exists, that's still intact to this day. And speaking of physician, it is because it was actually owned by one. And can anybody take a guess of what I'm talking about? Which house I'm talking about that's still intact that was built in the 1920s? So if you heard me earlier, I'm not talking about the Dorsey house. There's another house that still remains to this day that was built in the 1920s that still exists. As you know, if you're familiar with the Overtown area, you know that I-95 costs um, caused a huge destruct destruction in the community and a lot of the original structures were torn down. But this building, this constructed, this house still is intact and actually survived a close brush with the um, I-95. So can anybody take a guess of what I'm talking about? Like which house, which landmark I'm talking about? Okay. 
I know I've been talking off stop pretty fast, but can anybody take a guess? So, um, I'm just going to give you a couple more seconds and I'll give you the answer. So, the house that I'm talking about is actually the Chapman House which was owned by Dr. William A. Chapman. The house sits on underneath the I-95 ramp and it's on the grounds of Booker T. Washington High School. So who was um, Dr. William A. Chapman? So let me get into that. Dr. William A. Chapman was um, born in the late 1880s or we estimate the late 1880s and early 1900s and this is according to census records um, like I mentioned before sometimes you do see kind of um, um, uh, a range of birth years just plus or minus just because you know sometimes not all of the records or information were jotted down correctly but we estimate him to be born in the late 1880s early 1900s and he was married to mary l chapman he had two children wilhelmina and william chapman jr and he was actually a graduate of meharry medical college which is located in nashville tennessee and if you remember um, earlier, one of my previous segments, I talked about Meharry Medical College because that's where we have um, the first doctor that we can prove with records um, that practice in Miami. He was also a graduate of Meharry Medical College, and it was it was a you know it's a well um, prominent college um, that produced a lot of doctors that had lived in Overtown and, and, and um, so I thought that was uh, interesting. He was another product of Meharry Medical College and he graduated in 1913. He opened his practice in Miami in 1914 and the address was 410 Avenue G and like I said back then um, the avenues were not um, numerical. They went by letter and Avenue G was second avenue. And um, I actually want to show you a little bit things because I think it's really cool when you can actually kind of, um, you know, I'm talking about a person, but then you can actually read about them a little bit more closer and kind of relate to them a little bit more. So I was able to find a newspaper article from 1916 that talks about Willie Mae Chapman. And it shows that he actually donated the sum of $5 to the construction of Miami's um, Negro Industrial School. This was a precursor, precursor to Booker T. Washington High School. He donated in the sum of five dollars and this was in 1916. And then his involvement with the school was not only this one-time donation but he was a frequent supporter and he actually gave a commencement speech um, for the first class in 1917. So I just want to show you that newspaper article really quick. Give me one second. All right, give me one second. Let me just pull it up. All right, so this is, so what I'm going to show you is a news article from the Miami Herald that shows the people who um, donated to the construction of the school and it gives you a whole bunch of names. And um, the sum range from like $300 all the way down to $1. But as you know, like in any um, organization or any, um, you know, um, um, fundraising matter, every dollar counts. But I just want to show you this um, newspaper article. Give me one second. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just flip over. So here you have. Well, Dr. William A. Chapman donated $5. And if you look down below his name, you actually see E.M. Brickle, who also donated $5. There were also, um, these are the Brickles, the Brickle family, which own Brickle. And, all right, so now I'm gonna move on. I also found another newspaper article that talks about Dr. Chapman. Um, he treated a patient that was severely burned in 1917 um seems like the patient had an epileptic fit and he, oh, he fell over to the fire of a stove but uh, dr chapman was was there and was able to help him and let's see all right so throughout the years dr chapman moved his house uh, i mean moved his practice to different locations and um can we, can we see yeah, he moved his practice in a different location 
and by 1923, his practice was um, was also a physician office in a drugstore, and it was located in 218 Northwest 8th Street. And in that same year, in 1923, was um, the year the Chapman House was constructed. It was it is a two and a half story um, house. It has it had five bedroom and its address was 526 Northwest 13th Street. And a couple of years later, Booker T. Washington High School was built right across the street of the Chapman House. And according to a newspaper article that I read from the Miami Herald that was published in 19. 19- 93. It was not uncommon for Dr. Chapman to actually lend some of his book from his own personal library to some of the students. You know, the high school was right in front of the his house and it was not uncommon for him to actually lend some of the books. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And um, so now I'm going to get a little bit more into the detail of the actual house. So the house is an example of masonry vernacular architecture. So masonry vernacular architecture buildings um, are generally two stories and it features a simple rectangular rect- rectilinear plant, um, parapets and arcades. So please excuse me if I messed up um, some of these terminology. These are you know, architecture terminology, which I'm not that familiar, but I do know that this style was popular in Florida from 1920s to the 1930s. And there are three different types of masonry architecture that is common in South Florida, which are um, hollow clay tile, concrete block, and olithic limestone. Olithic limestone is just um, uniquely to South Florida. Um, However, um, the Chapman house is not of that style. It's actually concrete block. And yes, so the house was inhabited by Dr. Chapman until the 1940s, where uh, until he was unfortunately killed in a traffic accident in Jacksonville. And um, so now I just want to get into a little bit of more of the actual house itself because, you know, these, this is one of the few remaining buildings from the 1920s that's still intact and still remaining. So this information that I'm going to read to you is from its um, designation report, historic designation report. And I am going to flip the camera over. So give me one second. Okay. Okay. So this is a designation report that was, let me just scroll up to the top so you guys can see. And this is actually all available online. So if you go Google, you know, his Chapman House designation report, you can see, you will be able to find the PDF version. It was prepared by um, Sarah E. Eden in 1983. And it was designated in that same year. And I'm going to scroll down because this is basically shows um, it's a designation report basically reports arguing for its historic designation of why it should be preserved and not demolished. And it gives supporting evidence of the building, who it belonged to, what is it important in the community and its significance. So, you know, um, basically here it talks about um, the history of Dr. Chapman and, uh, you know, the fact that he was a influential doctor in the black community and and it also embodies these different distinguishing characteristics in the architecture style so give me one second and be, i know i haven't gotten into this but i want to show you like i said before um this is one of the few remaining structures that survived i-95 and if you look it's literally just on the cusp of i-95 and okay, I'm gonna just flip over. Give me one second. Okay, so this um, is didn't doesn't mean it didn't mean that I-95, um, the Florida State Road Department, did not want the house. It actually tried to acquire the house in the 1950s. However, um, Dr. Chapman's son, William Jr., refused to sell the house, and it actually remained unscathed. So it was one of those instances where imminent it was able to escape imminent domain. So let me go down and, okay, so let me flip over again. Okay, oh, okay, um, okay, so Dr. William Chapman's house is a two-story um, square structure with three bays across the north front facade. The building is topped with 
a hip roof and flare eaves and, sh and is covered with asphalt shingles constructed of concrete blocks and the building is finished with a smooth stucco. So I'm just going to show you a little bit more what it says. It's more architectural terms and talks about um, some of the features of the roof and things like that. But now I'm going to flip over and talk about Okay, so I'm going to flip over and talk about I-95. So in 1956, um, the Florida State Road Department made plans, drew up plans to uh, for the construction of I-95. And then when it came down to Miami, um, I-95, instead of going um, straight, which would miss Overtown, Color Town, it actually took a detour and it went straight into the heart of the community of Color Town. And because of that, a lot of the um, residents and a lot of the businesses were demolished. Um, this is because they were forced to sell or the house were taken due to eminent domain. At its height, uh, Color Town's height, um, its population was around 40,000 and after the construction of I-95, it was estimated that around 10,000 um, residents moved. So, but one of the houses that survived and one of the families that stayed was um, Dr. William H. Chapman's house. So, give me one second, let me flip over. Okay. And then, um, just bringing it closer and making that attachment from the Chapman House to the Black Archive, um, it's it's really interesting. You know, the Black Archives has been in in, in the business of historian you know, historic building and preservation of the black community for over 42 years. And, you know, this is one of the first instances where you see, like, one of our first stories where you see Dr. Fields fighting to preserve this building because in 1979, there was a newspaper article that was released by the Herald um, that showed that the school board was attempted to purchase the land uh, which the Chapman House sat on in order to build the new Booker T. Washington High School. However, um, Dr. Fields was able to succeed in designate uh, the Chapman House as a historic site in 1983. But later on, um, the school board did eventually acquire the house. However, since it was a designated historic site, it could not be demolished. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And um, so an interesting fact, I know a little bit side note, but um, the original Booker T. Washington High School was demolished in 1988 and the new school was built and open, was open in 1992. Um, the restoration of the Chapman House cost approximately $1 million. And later on, there was an agreement with the school board uh, between the school board and the Black Archives um, in order to let the Black Archives open a uh, Folk Life Children Education Center. So there you see that tie between the Black Archives and another historic um, building. So yes. So now what I'm going to do is show you a couple of pictures of the Chapman House. So just so you guys know, the Chapman House did serve as an educational building for a couple of years. Um, how, and throughout the years, its purpose was um, re... No was the house was repurposed for different for different programs but it still survived and it's still at the grounds of Booker T um Booker T's um parking lot and I know this whole time I haven't showed you a picture of the Chapman house but let me just do that right now okay give me one second and this house is pretty unique. As soon as you go into the parking lot of Booker T. Washington High School, it, it really sticks out. It's a two-story um, masonry architecture house. It's a pale yellow, and the, it also has the um, uh, monogram, it's like window covers. And let me show you the house. And an interesting fact, a garage was added in 1956 to the house. And um, the house is enclosed by a white picket fence. So it kind of gives you that, you know, um, like picturesque American dream house. And it is said, okay, let me, let me just, I'm trying to find a better picture. Um, so it was not, this type of house was not uncommon in that area. Um, there is, it was said that before I-95, you can see a, a lot of these houses that existed. It was very common that were there were two-story, and this was not actually the biggest house that 
that was built in that area there were bigger house than that and it basically attests to the show of how strong the economy and the wealth was in the black community in that time so give me one second okay this looks like a good picture yes and this again this is a perfect picture because you're literally going to see the chapman house and literally to the left of the Chapman House, immediately to the left, it's I-95. Okay, second. Okay, so this is the Chapman House. That is that pale yellow. And then right to the left, it's literally I-95. All right. Let me just flip it over. All right. So, um, I am... This is basically it for my segment today. So yes, it is true. There's another house from the 1920s that survived by 85 and was able to be designated as a historic site. Um, it's a two-story masonry house. And an interesting thing also, the Black Archives has a Chapman, uh, Chapman family collection with some um, dishware and some um, additional artifacts available. So that's a cool, interesting thing. I haven't had the opportunity to see these artifacts in person, but once the Black Archives is open, you know, keep that in mind if you ever want to check out a collection. Um, the Black Archives has a lot of things that ties into some of these historic places and um, historic families that contributed so much to the community. So yeah, so thank you guys. I hope you guys learned something today. Um, it's been an interesting session. So I want you guys to tune in for tomorrow's session, um, Today in Black History with Alicia Melton. Wednesday, it is Jeopardy Noir with the executive director. Thursday is profile, Legacies Profile and Greatness. Friday is the virtual field trip. I don't know about you guys, but I really enjoyed last week virtual field trip with at Virginia Key Beach. I thought it was really pretty cool and interesting. I've been to Virginia, Virginia Key Beach several times, but I never got to, gotten to explore the full grounds. And it was a pretty cool thing to see the sand, sand castle. So I know I want to check that out as soon as this um, quarantine pandemic is over. And then on Saturday, you have story time in color with Camila Pritchett. And please tune in next week for a special edition, Is It True? Tales from the Magic City, where we're going to be talking about Lancelot Jones and Porgy Key, which is an area in that was now known as Biscayne National Park. We're going to have special guests. It's going to be the assistant archivist, Louis Burthen, and then you're also going to have Greg Bremen from the National Park Service. He is a park ranger and it's going to be a pretty cool, interesting collaboration. So please join, please share. And if you can, please support us um, through sending, um, through Cash App at Balt, Money Sign Balt. And I hope you have a great day. All right.